Welcome to the OECD Forum. We're live and I'm here with Nicholas, Nicola Hazel. Uh, she's the director of the Women Entrepreneur Program, She Starts, and head of diversity and impact at Blue Chili. Blue Chili is one of Australia's leading startup tech accelerators and venture funds. So, thank you for, for joining us. Nicola. My pleasure. Um, since you were here last year, a lot of things have changed, mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking about Me Too and Time's Up. How, what kind of difference has that made in, the, in, in your industry? I think we've seen that there's become a real global push and movement, and indeed a global conversation about equality and inclusion in tech. And you know, tech being this driven part of our economy where we're seeing such a boom from government investment, corporate investment, and indeed from venture capital investment growing the future of our economies. The big question mark about how women, more than 50% of our global population, can participate in that part of economy um, has really come to the surface. And I think when we look right across the conversation around women's rights and the treatment of women across all industries, that has certainly had that flow on effect into tech. And it's actually been pinpointed in tech as a real problem that this industry which actually now affects every industry mm. has to grapple with and has to take true action on to ensure that we have a sustainable future where women are participating and indeed leading within this part of our economy. But um, you know the, the the culture of tech and finance industries I mean those are the sort of almost the twin evils for in terms of women um, and particularly in venture capital I mean in the US about 15 percent of venture capital investment went to women owned businesses in 2014 and then the number went down in 2016 to two percent so what's going on what can change and how is she start addressing that well we like to look for pointers of progress and indeed when we look at the figures that reflect in terms of investment in female-led businesses around the world. Unfortunately, progress is not what we're seeing. We're seeing challenges that continue to grow for women to access that kind of investment. You know, venture capital being the investment that allows an idea to really scale and move fast, which is so necessary in the, the current culture around tech and startups. So what we know, though, is that there are different points right along the pipeline where we need to address these barriers for women. It's not just when they step into a room and pitch for venture capital. It's all the way back to whether or not they can even see themselves in this emerging ecosystem and actually getting out there and starting startups to begin with. And then right the way through that journey, ensuring that those barriers that exist, the technical barriers, the cultural and structural barriers, indeed the financial barriers, um, are ripped down so that women can continue to progress through the ecosystem and when they walk into the room seeking investment that they're not just standing there with a powerful vision that is going to achieve investment and where issues like unconscious bias can be addressed but indeed that they look across the table and see female investors and that's part of the problem that we have here which is the venture capital industry is and the financial space is built up with people who have come through um, through the the ranks of entrepreneurship an area that has been male-dominated for decades now, and then they've gone on to become investors, yet we haven't seen women progressing through those ranks in the same way. And where we're seeing the difference being made is often when you have women at the table making decisions about investments into businesses that are led by women, and they're getting greater results. The, the figures speak for themselves. In, in Australia, are there women moving into you know, venture capitalism and, and uh, you know, angel, angel funds? Absolutely, we're seeing some really strong steps being taken to try and, try and drive more female participation, both in starting startup companies, but also in becoming investors in startup companies. It, we've still got a long road to go. Women are still not, um, by any means, anywhere close to a majority of, of investors in our country, but we have specific organizations that have been set up, like Scale Invest Investors who are in a group of people who are led by females wanting to invest in female-led companies. And then across the venture capital space, we're seeing more and more women wanting to get involved in this environment. Um, we've seen some of our firms who are actually starting to elevate women to partner level within their firms. And there are a small handful who are really uh, doing very well in this space. And as a result, their firms are also thriving. Um, you know, last year, 50% uh, of Blue Chili startups were female-led, and I guess that has to do with She Starts. So could you talk a little bit about that and uh, 
walk us through it. Well, we launched She Starts back in 2016 and really it was set up to be not just an accelerator to invest in more female-led companies coming into our portfolio, but to also drive a conversation and a movement for change right across our ecosystem to demonstrate the great results and the huge impact that we can have when we're backing more female-led companies. And that has had a fantastic flow and effect in our portfolio, but also across our ecosystem where we're seeing an increase in the number of women identifying not just as founders, but also as future founders, because they're starting to see themselves in this environment. So for us, we have more women applying to our accelerator programs across the board at Blue Chili. Uh, we have a new accelerator program that's launched just this week within the company, and they've got 40% of the participants in the boot camp alone are women. So we're seeing an uptake in the number of people who are wanting to get involved. The She Starts program itself is delivering on the story of what results look like. The founders from our first cohort who were selected in 2016 and came through the six-month accelerator in 2017 are absolutely kicking goals. They are raising significant investment. They are having international partnership deals and customers that are growing their businesses as they scale. And the second cohort that were selected at the end of last year and are now just over halfway through the accelerator program are really demonstrating how this model is driving results for them as individuals as well as for a community. Uh, we had our demo day uh, with the corporate partners from across Australia in, uh, in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago and these founders showed that in 12 weeks they had gone from what was literally just an idea, you know, something almost on the back of an envelope to a product, a tech product in the hands of customers that is ready to be piloted in some of the biggest companies in Australia and indeed around the world and, and that has been a really great for, result for us but also for the partners who are backing the program, you know, Australian companies like MYOB and a and who are looking for how they better engage as large corporates with startups and particularly female-led startups and then large global tech companies who are our partners as well like Microsoft and LinkedIn. Uh, has, have the, the ideas that the women come to you uh, to, to, to work with and she starts, have they changed between the first group and the, and the second group? I think what we see is a great diversity of ideas across both cohorts. So. The uniqueness of this program is it doesn't focus on one industry vertical. It is not one specific area, it's industry agnostic. And the founders that we look to invest in are people who have deep domain knowledge in their industry and particularly in how to solve the problem they're looking to solve. So in this year's cohort, we've got a couple of founders who are working in the energy and sustainability space. We have founders who are working in health tech, founders who are working in education tech. We've got founders specifically looking at issues around mental health. And it really shows that when you engage with founders on an idea of do you have a big idea for solving a problem in the world, you can attract a really diverse group of people. I mean, you mentioned the Me Too movement and one of the startups in our program, She's a Crowd, is specifically looking at how you use storytelling and digital storytelling to engage women to create data sets that can better inform the way we shape our cities for a space that is safe for women and addresses the issues of gender-based violence. And this stems out of this global conversation of the Me Too movement. So it's really remarkable how people are coming into tech. The, Zoe Conliffe, the founder of that startup, came from a background in, in international NGOs. So we're really seeing a new community of people coming into startups because they're there to solve problems and that's what we need to see to grow our ecosystem. What about um, sort of the next step after founding after founding your startup? I mean, um, there's a lot of their findings that women are less comfortable than men scaling up and taking their businesses global. Do you work on those issues as well? We need to help people identify the opportunities to do big things in the world. And when you bring in founders who have a real passion for solving global challenges, then you can grow in them an idea from the outset that where they're going with their idea must be global. It is around mindset and we do have to overcome the cultural barriers that have existed. You know, women are told from when they're very young girls that they should wait their turn, they shouldn't be too risky, they should be careful they should be smart about what they do if we can start to 
edge away at those cultural barriers and change the dialogue from when children come into this world right the way throughout their lives, encourage them to think big, encourage them to think globally, then we're going to see a flow on effect over time. And right now with current generations and, and indeed the women in the She Starts program are from their mid-20s right the way up to their 50s. So this is a program that engages with people of different ages, cultural backgrounds, sexuality, really driving an inclusive opportunity for for them and what we see from that is they're coming into this space and wanting to make a global impact and that enables them to see the potential of their company at scale. I think I'm going to end this interview with one last question and I'm going to play the devil's advocate on this. Is like if I am being cynical, I would say that um, getting more women into business, into upper management, uh, into CEO positions, uh, leading startups, that that's all about optics and that it just, it just pays lip service to gender equality for politically correct reasons. You know, when people say that, how do you respond to that? The data doesn't lie. When we have more women in leadership, the evidence is unequivocal around the world that we're seeing greater results, that greater diversity in leadership teams, which is often led by women starting in those positions and enabling a more diverse group of people to come into their company as it grows, results in better approaches to problems, a more collective impact in the way that they build their businesses, and better results in terms of financial returns as their businesses grow. I mean, the, the results in the United States in a study in the last couple of years has shown that women-led firms were driving much higher results than male-led firms. So the data doesn't lie. Uh, I don't think that it's even a case of being cynical. There is a human rights issue around the engagement of women and of ensuring that diversity is part of our future growth. There is absolutely an imperative here for us from a human rights perspective to ensure that we are enabling and equipping and empowering everybody in our communities to participate in the growth of, of our economy. But there is also a very strong economic argument for what we can't ignore, which is when 50% of the population are missing out, we cannot drive the kind of results that we want to receive as a globe. And indeed, when the data shows us that those results are going to be even higher when we have more women participating in leadership and we have a more equal representation and split across our economy, then really there isn't, there isn't many arguments that can be presented that would suggest we should not be taking this action. Well, women, start your businesses now. Thanks very much. My pleasure.